Evening and welcome to uh, tonight's session of Ask the Farmer Q&A. My name is Bridget Barry and I manage Farming for Nature. Uh, thanks for joining us tonight. Um, so Farming for Nature was set up in 2018 to inspire and encourage farmers that farm or wish to farm more with nature in mind. Um, one of the ways where we started was to build up a network of, uh, of ambassadors who are creating positive change on their land. Um, and this Q&A session is a great way to hear from these exemplary farmers uh, on their tried and tested methods on their farm. Um, so what we're going to do over the next hour is I'll kick start the session and ask our guest speaker a few questions. And then I encourage you all, any of you that have any questions, to write them in your chat box, which is on the black banner. Uh, and I'll facilitate these uh, questions. If you know of anyone that would like to join tonight and hasn't been able to make it or... Um, or you have to leave early, this session will be up on YouTube on our YouTube channel by tomorrow. So on to tonight's session, uh, I'm delighted to welcome Pat Lawler, um, an ambassador from 2020, join us. Uh, Pat is a beef and cereal farmer in with a 300 acre farm in Kilbegan in County Westmeath. He has both a, um, he's I suppose unusual in the sense that he's got a uh, what you call it, a, a field to fork business or a gate to plate business. Um, so we look forward to hearing more about that. Pat, thanks so much for joining us. Okay, you're very welcome, Bridget. It's delighted to be here. Great. Um, like I say, Pat, it's great to profile a farm, a, a farm like yours because it's uh, it is a business that goes all the way through. Uh, but before we get onto that, perhaps you could just set the scene for me. For those of us who haven't visited your farm, what does it look like? What's your farming system? Um, and what does it look like throughout the seasons? Okay, well, I suppose the farm is actually, uh, if you like, from a soil type, it's divided in, in equally uh, into two. Uh, and half of it is old permanent pasture, which is grassland that was laid down in, when old God was a boy, as we say around here, never has been ploughed and never will be ploughed in my time, because I think it would be a sin to plough it. And the other half then is arable land where I can sow oats. But in general, the land where I live around Westmead, in fact, all the land up around north of Tullamore, it's nearly all grassland. None of my neighbours have cereals at all because the land, by and large, is not suitable for anything other than grassland. It is good grassland, but there are plenty of fields with wet corners in them and rocks in them and uh, so on. So it's, it's not prime farming land, but it's good land. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And tell me, um, can you tell us about your own journey into agriculture and, and this farm? Uh, well, I don't think uh, an hour will get through my whole journey because <laughs> it started. Uh, I went to Ag College in 1965-66 in Warrenstown, and really it was the best year of my life. Uh, I have to be careful how loud I say that. My wife is upstairs. But anyway, <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so I started farming when I came back from there, and this is a family farm since 1844. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I never thought of doing anything else, only farming. I love farming. I love working. I've got not to like hardship. I used to like it, but when you get to my age, they say there's a difference between hard work and hardship. And hard work doesn't kill people, but hardship does. So I have my share of hardship done. <laughs> Fair it is. Yeah. When, when you get to this age, you begin to reflect on the past a lot more than when you're younger. So that's why I say things like that. <laughs> Fair enough. And tell me, um, you were saying that, I mean, none of your uh, neighboring farms have arable cereal farms. So was did you inherit a cereal and beef farm or did you move into that or what was no, uh, what happened there? Uh, yeah, my family, uh, great great grandfather was here since 1844. So uh, my father handed it on to me and his father to him and his father to him and so on. So I don't have any more land than I had when my father was around. Uh, and that's the way it's going to be. I have no interest in having any more land. Um, you, you know, enough is enough. I mean, um, I'm quite happy to, you know, just get a reasonable living out of what we have and enjoy what I'm doing. Why, why did you choose cereal? So if none of your neighbours are doing it, or no one in the area is doing it. Well, we always did some cereals here. Uh, and I think when I went into organic in 1999, uh, uh, there was a good price for growing organic cereals. So that, that made me focus more on cereals. So as I said, 
the farm is half and half cereals and old permanent pasture. So I can make more money out of the cereals by a mile than I can out of the cattle. Mm-hmm. Okay, interesting. We'll come back to that in a while. But um, just on the uh, organic, you were saying in 1999, you changed to organic. What was the kind of pivotal moment? Why did you change? Well, we were always in intensive winter beef finishing from the 60s and 70s and 80s. And when it came into the 90s, the, the margin in that began to decline. Um, so uh, making a long story short, I was trying to decide what change I was going to make because I had four children that were due to go to education and so on. So I had to make some change. I looked at uh, going into pedigree cattle. I mean, I love cattle. I, I looked at going into that area and I looked at maybe going into forestry and I looked at going into organic. So organic made the most sense to me because I saw a greater margin in it uh, without me having to make hardly any changes in the infrastructure in the farm. Because we already had a lot of cattle housing using straw bedding rather than slats. So we had to make no alterations to our housing at all coming into organic farming. Mm. So, and, and the margin definitely was, was higher. No, it, 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 it just made sense to, me, sense to me, but the motivation was to try and make more money. I, I, I have to say that unashamedly because the word environment, our emissions and so on hadn't been invented in 1999. Mm. Not in general terms, anyway. Mm. So you found back then, and both then and now, being organic adds value to your product. It definitely does in the cereals. Uh, not so much anymore in in the beef, because if you're trying to fatten uh, organic animals in the winter time, assuming that they're not Hereford and Angus, which generally they're not, because you can't get those uh, uh, out there. Uh, you have to feed them cereal or feed nuts of some type. And you're talking about 600 euros a ton plus, you know, so that just doesn't add up with the price that was being paid. You are not making money out of that, you know. So what I do now is I sell my cattle before they go into that winter, into that last winter, I sell them to some other farmer who have, for their own reasons decide they can make money out of them. And so I sell them in October every year. And is there quite a big organic beef market? Like, is there quite a lot of farmers in the area well, organic beef when you're selling them on to finish? Yeah, well, most farmers that are in <coughs> organic are in organic beef. That, that's the majority of farmers that are, that are certified organic are, are, are producing cattle of some description, <clears throat> either selling as weanlings or, for <clears throat> excuse me, or forward stores or going to the factory with the animals, you know. Mm. So... There, you see, some people grow cereals on their farm to feed to their own animals. So they would say, well, look, we don't have to give the 600 euros a ton to buy uh, feed for these cattle. We just grow our own. Mm. <clears throat> but it depends on how you do the sums, you know. So uh, if you look at it that way, you might be making very much money out of your cereal crop and you're making money out of your cattle. Mm. But if you charge 600 euros a ton to the cattle, then you're making money out of cereals and you're not making it out of cattle if you follow if you follow what I'm saying, you know. But it sounds like you're still in cattle, even though it's not maybe making a huge profit margin because of the love of it, is it? Well, uh, there are a few reasons. Number one, I have them in the winter housing for the first uh, winter, which is as weanlings, and they produce farmyard manure. And that is really valuable to me as a cereal farmer. Uh, Number two, the area of the farm that is old permanent pasture, that good grassland. What do I do with it? Either I rent it out to somebody else, I let the grass grow and do nothing with it, or I graze some cattle on it. So I'm grazing cattle on it and doing it the best I can and all to as high a standard as possible. But it's not a particularly profitable business. You would want a day job along with it. Mm. And our day job is our porridge business. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. We'll come on to that in a minute, but maybe you can just um, tell me about your crops and your rotation and what okay. what that looks like. Okay, so it's uh, we only grow oats and, and we grow it as winter oats. Uh, the rotation is two years winter oats and then two years uh, grassland, but it's a mixture of red clover and ryegrass. It will be 75% red clover, 25% ryegrass. The purpose of the red clover is to 
fixed nitrogen into the soil for those two years before I go back into winter oats again. So, so it's harvesting nitrogen for the following winter oat crops, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, and while it's in that red clover ryegrass phase, you can cut it for silage two or three times, even four if you really wanted to. Uh, you could graze it with care and you could mulch it or you could do nothing with it. You know, so I don't, uh, wouldn't, wouldn't advocate doing the final one, doing nothing with it, but it has been experimented with in, in the UK. Just leave it there, let it grow and let it die and let it grow again and then plow it when the autumn comes. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know what the outcome of that is going to be. So I graze it uh, uh, early in the year and late in the year. And in between then, I will take whatever silage I want from it and I will mulch it as well. If it's growing too fast for the cattle, I'll go and mulch it. And mulching is, some people don't know exactly what mulching is. Uh, it's a machine, a mulcher is a machine like a topper. If you take a major topper, it's a machine exactly the same as that, but it has double the amount of rotors in it. And each rotor has double blades, two layers of blades. And what it does is it cuts, chops up all the material really fine, spreads it the full width of the machine so that it will die away and disappear into the ground in two or three weeks and it won't inhibit the regrowth where if you go in there with the topper it tends to leave it in a row and that will inhibit the regrowth and slow slow down the whole cycle so <clears throat> the value of mulching is you're adding green manure to the soil and that's really good for the soil biological activity and when you cut the crop you're making it grow again so it's fixing more nitrogen and you're causing the roots underneath are creating more soil biological activity. So organic farming, particularly in cereals, is all about soil microbiology. Mm -hmm. And do you, do you test your soil, Pat? Like, do you, do you keep an eye on what's happening in your soil or how do you keep an eye on what's happening in your soil and what it needs? Uh, from a soil <laughs> biology point of view, it's very difficult to get um, an accurate picture of what's there. And the tests are very expensive as well. You've got to send them uh, over to the UK to get them tested and uh, it's it's quite complicated because you're really the day you take the sample it needs to go straight into the lab so if you're taking a sample today and it has to go to the UK it could be a week before it's tested so you can't rely on the results so I do all the good practices that I think are the correct ones so that's the biology part of it and I can explain how I do that in a moment if you wish uh, but from the ordinary soil sample that a farmer would be advised to do, which is, uh, it will tell you the N, sorry, it'll tell you the P and the K, the phosphorus and the potassium, the pH, and maybe the magnesium or manganese. Um, so in my experience, that's not really important in organic farming, because all that tests is the soluble nutrients that are available to the plant there and then in the juice of the soil, if you want to put it that way. Whereas in organic farming, uh, you're looking at the total quantity of phosphorus and potassium in the soil. That's not readily available. And it only becomes available when the bugs in the soil, the soil biology, processes them and makes them available in a form that the plant can use. So that's the value of the biology. It processes the nutrients in the soil and makes them in a form that the plants can take up. So if I got a soil sample sent off to the lab in the usual way, that conventional farmers do and it might give, it will give me the index one two three or four of p and k the indexes on my farms are between one and two now if somebody advisor looked at that in conventional farming they would say you need a heap of fertilizer on that you know you would produce nothing off it but in organic farming that's not the case it can be down at those levels because i just emphasize again that the test only uh, shows the soluble fertilizer that's there ready. It doesn't show the total amount. And the biology releases the total amount for the plant. Okay, interesting. So, I mean, do you, have you ever had times when you've um, uh, like had to rebalance the soil or anything? Because uh, obviously in organic, you're, you can't do chemical inputs, but you know, what do you do if you feel the soil needs a, a, a kind of a boost? Boost, yeah. Okay, we're assuming that your pH is correct, and if it's not, 
you are allowed to co uh, correct it with lime in the ordinary way. Um, right, I, I take care of soil fertility by number one, putting on farmyard manure every year. Not enough, you never ever have enough farmyard manure, but I put on whatever I have. Uh, that's number one. Number two, by growing the clover, uh, it's very uh, it's a very good soil conditioner in that, as I said earlier, it promotes soil biological activity. And if you're mulching it and so on, you're putting back down green material into the soil, which is very, very good for the worms. Um, I do as little disturbance as I can on the soil, but it's inevitable that you're, if you want to sow a crop, you have to do some soil disturbance. You know, you can't, you can't make an omelet without cracking eggs, and it's as simple as that. So I would be really careful about um, uh, avoiding co compacting the soil. You know, that's, that's, that has to be avoided at all costs. And I really hate these 250 horsepower tractors that, that are brought in to spread fertilizer and to spread slurry and all that kind of stuff. They're really hammering the soil. The other thing to remember about organic farming is when you stop using uh, uh, granular fertilizer, chemical fertilizer, and sprays, and they're acid-based in general, they, the, the soil pH will increase once you stop using them, right? And I have, no, I have seen it over the years, and my contractor that does my plowing for me here would agree that over the years, the soil texture has improved enormously. And that is helped by, by the roots of the clover. The, clover. the red clover root goes down about six or seven inches into the soil. Mm -hmm. And when you plow, or if you dug up a root of a red clover, it's like a dock root almost. You know, there is, there's an awful lot of energy in that when you plow it back into the soil. Mm. Interesting. You, you wouldn't kind of know that, would you? Um, since being organic, sorry. <coughs> since being organic, have you seen um, nature responding much on your farm? Like, have you seen, apart from your soil, have you seen other changes on your farm, Pat? Um, it's hard to be scientific about that, but all I can say is that about seven or eight years ago, Borbia were doing a survey on birds on farms and they got Birdwatch Ireland to do to carry out the survey and they called here to do a survey on our organic farm and the man going around it was in the summertime and he he made note of every songbird he could hear as we walked around and he counted over 30 songbirds different songbirds now I wouldn't have had a clue whether that was good bad or indifferent and he said well look it's not Guinness book of records but it's about three times the amount I would expect to get on a conventional farm. Mm, interesting, yeah. So that's that's one point. The other point is, well, in growing the cereals, we don't have any problem from pests, from leather jackets or from aphids or anything like that. And uh, I suspect, and I have no proof of it, whatever, because we're not killing those pests by applying uh, sprays, uh, there's food there for the birds. So the birds are here because the food is there and birds eat the food, which is are the pests. So they're helping me because I'm not killing their, their food, if you follow what I'm saying. Yeah. And do you do anything to attract more, um, I suppose, pollinators? Because pollinators must be very important to your crops as well. Um, so, I mean, do you do pollinator strips or? No, I, I don't. I don't. But um because my my rotation is a very short term rotation. It's only two years in oats and two years in red clover. And red clover, for example, with the bees, it's not a particularly attractive one to the bees because, as I understand it, that the the the, the flower in the red clover is too long. The petals in it are too long for the bees to be able to reach down and get out the nectar. Whereas white clover is is different. So I, I I'm. I suppose what we're doing is we're leaving quite wide margins. Our, our hedges are very wide anyway, and then we don't plow right into the very ditch as well. Uh, in about 10 different fields, we have fenced off small areas and planted uh, woodland trees there. I mean, I've done that maybe about 15 years ago, and it wasn't part of any scheme. I just did it because I like trees. I know I've planted tens of thousands of trees over the years. But I, if you had feel where there's an awkward corner to drive into or a wet corner, you know, I fence that off. It's only maybe an eighth of an acre or something. 
and plant it with trees and just walk away and leave it there, mm. you know. And, and if you added all those together, you probably have three or four acres of a wood, mm. you know. So that has been very good for, for bird life and then whatever, whatever biology lives on the trees, which I don't really... I can't uh, say anything about that, you know, yeah. getting into you, science for too much. I mean, so what you're kind of saying is that this is kind of a space that any farmer could consider on their farm without it taking. Do you feel that adds to your product? You're kind of saying it might do because it, it increases the kind of habitat for the birds who are then eating the pests. Is Would that be fair to say? Well, it's a, all I can do is speculate on that. I mean, I've no... I have no proof of that, whatever, but it kind of makes sense. Mm. You know, if there are more birds there, there are more predators there on the pests and so on. And uh, we just, we never have a problem with leather jackets or, or any of those pests that farmers have to go out and spray for. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I do with the hedgerows, about every 150 meters uh, on the, I, sorry, I only cut the hedgerows on the tillage part of the farm. They've, they've always been cut there. so. We, we cut them as gently as possible, uh, but about every 150 yards, we leave a bush. That could be either a white thorn or a black thorn, whatever happens to be there. And we just let it grow to its own, its, its own contentment. And I've been doing that for 15 or 20 years. Mm. And those bushes now have berries on them and the birds build nests in them, they have ivy on them and so on. And they're just lovely uh, habitats for the smaller birds. But the other thing just about hedge cutting, uh, I see so many hedges around the countryside murdered, mm. cut to the butt, and it's an absolute shame as far as I'm concerned. You know, and I think trying to tell a, a, a contractor not to cut that hedge low, you know, even in my own case, I can't get the contractor to cut it as high as I would like him to cut. You'd have to stand over them with a poker. I don't know what it is, but I often wonder if there are courses out there for hedge trimmer operators and show them what is best practice in this? Mm. You know, I, I'm not saying to be interested in it, but I think that's where it needs to go. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I think we can all agree, especially a few weeks ago, there was a, there's at the end of February, there's always a huge butchering of the countryside in preparation for the 1st of March when it's recommended not to cut your hedgerows anymore. Um, have you noticed uh, from being organic and then we'll move on to the business side of things, have you noticed much uh, benefit, say, to your animals or or even to to your family or any of that but but mostly to your animals um well i suppose uh no i don't really uh to any great extent i certainly don't have any more problems than i had from a veterinary point of view mm. uh, what i would say is that um you know i buy weanlings every autumn um from other farmers and weanlings like are notorious for getting pneumonia and so on um uh, and so that first winter is the time that there might be some problem with them so uh this winter gone by uh i haven't had to treat one animal mm. not one you know mm. and they will go to grass and the only thing that i might ever do if there's an animal not thriving i will take a dung sample and send it to the lab for analysis to find out have the internal parasites you know, uh, uh, stomach worms, lung worms, rumen fluke, or whatever it might be, you know. And generally, it's one of those, uh, the vet will recommend a dose, and once the vet recommends it, you're allowed to do it under organic rules. So, um, and just I Just the one animal or the herd? You just do the one animal? Just one animal, yeah. And I, I think the organic uh, protocol there is very sensible, that you should not be giving these doses unless you can show evidence that the animals need them because i firmly believe that farmers across the country are wasting a fortune on dosing cattle mm. you know uh, because I, I i i've for years i've always been sending samples off to the lab it costs very little money you'll have it back in 48 hours and that's it interesting yeah because I, I there are a lot of farmers i believe that are you know on a daily basis would feed their cattle antibiotics when they're inside throughout the winter just to you know, preventative as opposed to... Yeah, but on uh, on the other hand, the, the nature of organic farming is that it's not intensive. Mm. And if you're not intensive, you 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 won't have those most of those problems. Mm. Uh, and if you are intensive, the opposite is the case. Like you're in the fast lane if you're intensive and you can't go below 120, you know, and you're going to get problems there. So you have to have a solution to them. Mm. 
mm. you know now that's not a long term that's not very good long term you know but anyway yeah it's an interesting one though, whether the fast lane you, you know you might have larger productivity uh but you also possibly have larger of inputs and therefore Literally you not. know profit margins might not necessarily equate yes but, I mean, that's case by case obviously yeah. on the farm well one point i think that's worth making and that people who come to visit the farm here are surprised at the permanent pasture land that i talked about that's just for grazing for the cattle it's not even suitable for cutting it's not level enough and so on that land has got no fertilizer of any description, either bag fertilizer, slurry, dung, since 1981. Mm. And the grass hasn't stopped growing. Mm. The sky hasn't fallen in. <laughs> you know. So I think the price of fertilizer at the moment will make farmers, a lot of farmers, aware that, look, maybe we don't need this much fertilizer at all. I think they'll be surprised with the amount of grass that can grow with very little fertilizer. Mm. Yeah, it's a it's kind of a drug that many people have come hooked on. Um, so you produce everything from beef to biscuits. Uh, that's a huge yeah. diversification. Do you want to just tell us a bit about your your cereal business? OK, well, um, I suppose just oh, where it started and why it started. So, OK, well, I'll, I'll just go through the growing of the crop, if you like. Yeah, of course. Uh, yeah, perfect. And, that, and there's not too much detail involved there because it's very simple. So it's winter oats. We put out the farmyard manure in September. Uh, and we plough in October, assuming the weather, we get a few fine days, we plough and sow in October. And we plough in a conventional way and then use a one-pass system and we don't roll it, we just walk away and virtually come back with the combine harvester the following July. The only weed issue that we have is docks. And uh, they're, uh, we'll never get rid of them, but we have them under control and basically what we have to do is before the harvest, about a fortnight before the harvest, when the docks are visible and the seed head is visible, we will go out into the field and uh, cut the dock below the seed head with the secateurs and bag it and bring it away. Now, all that does is stops the docks from spreading. It won't wipe them out. Mm. So that's the only problem we have. We won't have a weed problem because whether you have weeds or you haven't weeds, it's about competition. So if you have a very, if you have a good crop of cereals, whether it's wheat, barley, or, or oats, you have a bad crop of weeds. So for example, if you're sowing winter cereal, my cereal now is about a foot high, and the weeds are only waking up, hmm. because in the autumn the weeds go into dormancy. Most of them do. So in the spring the weeds are only waking up, so they haven't a hope of of beating or competing with the crop of oats. Mm -hmm. if you sow a spring crop so the crop and the weeds are starting off at the same time mm -hmm. so that's a much bigger challenge so therefore weeds aren't a problem disease is not a problem because we're not pushing the crop so if you put on a lot of fertilizer because you want the maximum tonnage per acre which is what they want in conventional farming you're you're pushing the plant so fast that you're you're messing around with with its immune system and it's not able to fight off those fungal diseases so, but if you let it grow at its own pace, the way God intended, it will not get disease of any of any harm. You might get a little bit down at the bottom, but it's absolutely not a problem. And as I said earlier, the pests are not a problem because the birds take care of them. So then harvesting takes place at the end of July. We bring it into our grain store where it's dried down to about uh, 30 and a half percent moisture. Uh, and then it's stored in our shed. Uh, and then we, take it out of there to go to the mill as we wanted for for processing the porridge. But before it goes to the mill, it has to be dried again down to 10% moisture. So there's a lot of expense. So drying grain is a dirty, dusty, expensive job. Mm. You know, so it has to be dried twice before it goes to the mill. So that's basically the process of from sowing the corn until it goes to the mill. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's milled, uh, we got it, as I say, milled under contract. Uh, then it comes back to us in 25 kilo sacks as rolled porridge, the porridge oats. And we have a, our own unit in Tullamore, which is our local big town. And that's where we bag it into the kilo and three kilo sacks. And we distribute it from there. It goes all over the country, but it's not in the supermarkets. We haven't gone down that route because we don't need to. Mm -hmm. And it's also exported to the US. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, one of the downsides of our policy to stay artisan is that we can never expand and we can't grow any more oats in the farm because we don't have enough, we don't have any more suitable land and we won't buy in from anybody else. So it will always remain a small business and we're quite happy to remain artisan like that. We're getting a living out of it and we're happy with that. Yeah, because I'd say there's a good demand as well, is there, with kind of for organic oats, uh, oh. Irish grown organic oats, I'd say you could like quadruple your business, could you? Or? We, we could sell many more times what we sell. I mean, we're refusing customers every other week. So we started just to go back a little bit. We started, I started that in the, the December 2010, a real bad 2010-11 winter West, yeah. or freezing all over Christmas oh, yeah. uh, up, up here anyway. Um, so that's when I started it and uh, I first brought it to the public to a uh, Christmas craft market in Mullingar uh, and within two days I had, so I gave it out to some people that I knew. Within a couple of days I had phone calls that they wanted more and I had a shop that phoned me uh, in Mullingar, a health food shop. I gave them the order they wanted, which was valued 18 euros. I got a check for 18 euros, which I'm so excited about. <laughs> so uh, now we're like, since year two, we're, we're selling everything we produce. Mm. We could sell much more. So in 2014, we started making cookies, handmade oat cookies. And um, there are four different flavors of those, but they're very, they are the higher end of the market price wise because they are handmade. And the ingredients in them are, if you take just a plain one, it's uh, 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 unbleached flour, muscovado sugar, uh, unsalted Irish creamy butter, and organic oats, and a bit of sea salt and raising agent. So there's no crap in there, whatever. Mm -hmm. there's the ingredients on the packet, a child that can read, can read them, not only read them, but could understand them. And the ingredients will be in anybody's house. No. So why did you diversify to biscuits if you had enough market with the porridge oats? Uh, well, they don't take up much oats. Mm. And, you know, I, I hope the nature that have a go. Why not? You know, mm. I'd, hate, I'd hate to die wondering. Mm. And it was, it was the same with the porridge. I mean, I had no, did no feasibility study. I didn't borrow any money because we didn't need any money. As I said, we got everything done on contract in the beginning. So, and I think it's, it's quite a good model for a startup. You know, uh, so we've no machinery, we've no vans that are branded or anything. I just have an estate car, we use that for deliveries, you know, and then it's just used as our ordinary car when it's not doing that. You're definitely like I'm down in Cork, you're in my local health food store. Uh, so you use a national distributor, don't you, outside your, yeah. your estate car? Yeah, yeah, we, we distribute in the Midlands ourselves. Yeah. We will do Mullingar, Port Leash, Eden Dairy and Tullamore and Athlone and in between. And we sell online as well. Mm. And then we have a distributor who's based in Dublin and they do the rest of the country as it were, you know. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, I mean, in a certain sense, it's probably nice to continue to meet your consumer and, you know, your customer, your retailers and get feedback from them as opposed to just 100% going to a dis uh, distributor. Yeah. Uh, we've done Bloom for a number of years. We've done Tullamore Show. We've done the ploughing and so on. And as a farmer, I never stood behind a counter in my life before, you know, and it's, it's an amazing experience, particularly when your own product is there and you have nowhere to hide. Mm. You can't spoof, you know, because they'll come up to you and they'll say this, that or the other. Oh, thankfully, it's mostly positive. But I mean, there is nowhere to hide. And it is lovely to get then the positive feedback. It really is. It's, 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 it's a great feeling for people to come up to you and say how much they like your product. They really, mm. farmers don't experience that generally. Mm. Like farmers who sell cereal or milk or beef to a processor in the ordinary way, they have, you could say they have no customers mm. and they never get that feedback, whether it's good, bad or indifferent. So it really, it, it completes the circle. Mm. Oh, and yeah, that's, that's a very important point. Yeah. Because I mean, like, um, obviously, a lot of your peers would be selling to like Flavins or organic porridge, or I don't know where Bullalon, where they get their organic porridge, but I presume it's Irish. Uh, 
or not. I don't know. <laughs> uh, so, um, but look what I look at the packet. Look at the packet. Okay, I, I obviously need to. Um, but you decided not that you had decided that you wanted to go to market, obviously. Yeah, well, I mean, I in, in the beginning in organic, I uh, there was no organic advice out there. Uh, and even still in organic, farmers have to make it up as they go along. Because there is no research being done in Ireland on organic at all, other than what farmers are doing on their own farm. So, and, and there are structures now where farmers can go and visit organic farms uh, uh, when there are open days. But when I started in 1999, there was none of that. Uh, so I had to go to England for farm walks and for conferences and so on. So that's where I sort of, learned all my basic stuff about organic i mean can't you imagine flying over to england just for a farm walk and coming back that evening <laughs> like it sounds mad but that's that's what i had to do mm. um, but then over there i saw how uh, farmers over there were adding value to their products and that's kind of what gave me the idea mm. and i said why can't i do that at our roads why not and have a go you know and don't this is really important and albert reynolds was the first person i remember saying this don't be afraid to fail. You know, have a go. The sky won't fall in. Yeah, no valid point. Um, you mentioned earlier that you do um, open farm and farm walks and stuff. I mean, how important is it to you to kind of educate others on what you're doing and share your knowledge and find out what, you know, share what you've done on your farm with others? Yeah, I, I think farmers in general are very good at sharing their knowledge. You know, I, I enjoy sharing whatever bit of knowledge I have in what I've, the experience that I have throughout my life, because when you get to my age, you have a lot of experience. I'm not saying you have a lot of wisdom, but you certainly have experience. And you can learn good things. You can learn how to do things well on a farm, and you can go to a farm and learn how to do things badly. Mm -hmm. So you have to pick and choose, you know, what you bring home out of any farm visit. So I, I've always enjoyed um, sharing knowledge with people. I mean, I, I spent uh, a number of years, going back 30 years ago, giving classes to transition year students in secondary school. And I'm, I'm not a teacher, you know, but I just enjoy doing it. And so I've taken tours in a farm here for maybe 20 years, mainly European uh, holiday makers who are interested in visiting a farm. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, I, I like, to educate, no, I won't, I won't say educate, but I like to inform uh, people who are not from a farming background about how their food is produced and give them some sense of what life is like on a farm. Mm -hmm. Because at, nowadays, they really don't know it very well. They really mm -hmm. aren't, understandably, you know, it's, it's an urbanized society now and that's it. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing when you go to places like Germany and Austria and stuff, you'll never see a cow outside and uh you know and what we take for granted yeah. as normal you know is is not in other countries um i just have one or two other questions but if anyone has any questions for pat please write them in the chat box and uh we can ask them to him uh, pat what do you think is uh, the biggest challenge for small artisan producers like you getting to market or what do you have, what have you found the biggest challenges for you um to be honest, I, I, I suppose, you know, I went on a wing on a prayer, to be honest. I mean, I had no experience, good, bad, or indifferent. And I was, I mean, we have a good product, but we were lucky as well. You know, we, we met a lot of helpful people on the way. Um, we got massive publicity for free, you know, because at that time, artists and producers were a little bit, uh, uh, unusual in that there weren't very many of them you know whereas now the, the artists and producers are 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 you will find them quite frequently on the internet and uh, we all know artists and producers now in farmers markets when i started out it was quite unusual for a farmer to do something himself like that or herself um so what advice would i have um i so say first of all you have to have a product that is very good and that is better than the products you're trying to compete with. So I suppose if you go out into the marketplace and see what products are out there that would likely compete with the one you are and see how you can do yours better and make it different from all the rest and make 
them also runs, if you like. You know, so it, it, it has to make itself different some way. And it's not just enough to have the packaging different or the name different. And on a name, I would find it a big advantage to call it a name that people, number one, that it means something to them, right? Kilbegan is a name where the, before the motorways, there was traffic jams in it. There's Kilbegan races and there's, there's Kilbegan whiskey. The second thing is, it's an easy name to pronounce. Because hmm. when I have German groups here, they could all pronounce the word Quebec because it sounds as it looks. Hmm. So don't, don't be much as you might like an Irish name to it, unless it's a, a, a real, you know, it's a bullseye name, don't use it. And don't use, if I use Ballard, which is where I'm from, Ballard means nothing to anybody. You know, are there one L's in it or two L's? Is it Ballard or Ballard or what is it? You know, so keep it simple. Make sure your product can be differentiated in some way, either price or quality or the good story that you have. Mm. The packaging, fine, keep it simple, but there's no point in having your packaging too glossy because that might get you some sales. But at the end of the day, they'll only buy it once because of the packaging, mm. you know, to try it out. If the product isn't good enough, they won't be back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, a, it's very valid, actually. Uh, I mean, you were saying about how you, you used to have to go for farm walks to England. Where these days, where where can where do you or where can people go for advice and support? Do you think or troubleshooting or? Well, Chagas have two organic advisors for the whole country, <laughs> and they do the best they can, and they're two super people. But I mean, they cannot service the whole country. Uh, the uh, knots, which a lot of your the the people listening to this might know about. Uh, they run courses in organic farming. The organic certification bodies, I'm certified with the Organic Trust. Uh, it, it has open days for uh, organic farming as well. And the Department of Agriculture, uh, certainly before COVID started, they would have maybe six or eight or 10 demonstration, organic demonstration farms around the country. And farmers could go and visit them. There's no charge or anything. And they would have them on the various enterprises for, for, for farming, whether it's dairy, uh, cereals, beef, um, vegetables, uh, you know, different aspects of horticulture and so on. Interesting, yeah. So we'll just move across to some questions here from, from the audience. Uh, Connor Tierney has asked, what yield in ton acre do you get from the oats? Uh, we're looking at uh, around two and a half tons. Um, Depending on the weather, it could be a little bit less. Some years it's a little bit more, but we'll be very happy if you get an average of two and a half tons per acre. Okay. Uh, Darren Dara McKiernan has asked, can you ask Pat about the energy use on the farm? I believe he has solar panels and a wind turbine. Yeah, well, I put up the solar panels and the wind turbine in 1999, and that was novel, really. Mm -hmm. And it that was why I put them up because I was interested in them, always interested in them. Um, I just wanted to see how good they were or otherwise. So the solar panels, I'd certainly be delighted with them from the point of view of heating water. They're absolutely a no brainer. Uh, that's what they are. They're not for electricity. But I had a smaller one then that was working in combination with the wind turbine. But the wind turbine now is only a small little Mickey Mouse one. Uh, that you have in a boat that would just uh, run lights off and that's about all so i put them there as as demonstration units for school pupils uh, that were coming to visit the farm to, to show them how they work so all i did with the with the electricity part was just to run lights in a visitor center that i had at that time but uh, from the point of view of heating water solar panels are a no-brainer mm -hmm. great uh, and they've come a long way, obviously, since 1999. Oh, yeah, it's, yeah, um, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, Denise Boothman has asked, have you ever used biostimulants in the line of liquid seaweed or anything else like that on your farm? No, no. I feed seaweed to the cattle as a mineral supplement. So we say during the winter time, the cattle are just getting uh, silage, no meal, whatever, uh, and about 80 grams of seaweed uh, per animal per day. I haven't used any of those stimulants at all. Um, probably my policy on that is uh, I'm not having any problems with the, with the crops that I'm growing. 
And if I have a problem, then I'll go and investigate it and see what the problem is, see what the deficiency is. Now this year, this spring as it so happens, and I'm not sure why it has happened, in one field I have some manganese deficiency. So I'm allowed to put on a certain uh, approved um, uh, liquid feed of manganese on that crop, which I'm putting on tomorrow. And hopefully that will solve the problem. I don't know why it's there. Maybe because there was so much growth over the winter that the crop um, grew faster than the manganese became available. I just haven't a clue. There's so many unknowns when it comes to growing any kind of crop in farming and everybody, everybody knows that. And this is one of them as well, you know, mm -hmm. and there might be a patch that's, that's, um, uh, uh, has manganese deficiency here and you could have to go 50 yards again before you get another patch about the size of a desk. So mm. why is that? I don't know. Mm. I don't know. But by and large, I haven't used any of those things at all at all. You okay, know. The other, uh, sorry, I'm just interrupting you now, I know in your questions, but I, I didn't see any, anything about composting a farmyard manure. So I don't know whether you want to carry on with the question or I'll come back no, to no, that. No, 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 work away. Just give it, yep, yeah, give us a... Yeah. Wait, okay, so you compost your manure, do you? Yeah, it's a really important thing here because when you ask me about how do I keep up the soil fertility, I put a, apply the farmyard manure, but I also compost it beforehand. So when the cattle go out of out of the sheds uh, now, uh, I go in uh, with my uh, 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 loader and turn all that farmyard manure, uh, turn it over into a heap about four feet high, and then I cover it with a material called topics it, it's like i don't can you see that there yeah 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 it, it's a blanket type material that uh, keeps the, the 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 clamp of manure moist it helps the temperature to increase more quickly we wanted to get up to 65 degrees centigrade and it also keeps in almost all the emissions because if you turn farmyard manure you get the smell of of farmyard manure, which to me is lovely. To most people, it's to our neighbors, it might not be. Mm -hmm. But what we're smelling are emissions, right? So that's, they're being lost from the farmyard manure and they're going into the environment, which is bad as well. So this stuff almost completely wipes out any smell. And it's, it's not fully waterproof, but when you put it on, even if you use it outside, the water will run off it. So it's an ideal material for for covering farmyard manure during this process. So I will turn that farmyard manure about three or four times during the summer at maybe two week intervals or whatever, but I will monitor it by checking the temperature of the clamp. Once it gets to 65 degrees, you turn it. Mm. Right. So by the time I get to the end of the summer, that is well rotted farmyard manure. It is not compost because compost is like soil. You shouldn't be able to see the original constituent parts of it but what we're see, you can still see the straw the little particles of straw in mine but it spreads very easily and evenly and it also has reduced in volume quite a bit so that the spreading costs are reduced as well so that's a really important thing that helps the soil fertility and by aerating all of that and the decomposition you're increasing the soil microbiology in the far in the clamp of farmyard in europe and remember, if you take one teaspoonful of soil, there's about a billion bacteria just in one teaspoonful. And science is only beginning to appreciate soil biological activity now mm. because there's no money in it for anybody. <laughs> so big companies won't fund the research. college yeah. the research in this. So this is why I said earlier, we have to make it up as we go along. And I mean, it's not like slurry that you can spread. So do you literally, you go out with a, a loader and you just kind of, plop it out in the field and kind of pike it out yeah but it is spread very evenly and you must treat the farmyard manure as if it was fertilizer you cover every square meter in the field mm. you know you don't just get rid of it mm -hmm. you know you, you give it an even coat all over the field and mm -hmm. treat farmyard manure uh like some people love drinking guinness i love farmyard manure that's <laughs> That's uh, as serious as I take all of that kind of stuff. Yeah, so. yeah. It's not the first time I've heard that people saying uh, their obsession with it all. Um, Margaret Brennan has asked, how much uh, was the yield much lower in the first few years after conversion to organic before your soil adjusted improved? Yeah, it, that's a fair, a fair, uh, important question. 
it was a bit, but I have to say that because we were never in really intensive cereal producers, uh, and we always had straw bedded sheds and the farmer and manure went out, so our land was never drained out of nutrients or biology. So we didn't have as big a jump to make in terms of soil fertility from conventional uh, to organic. But I think it's a reasonable expectation that the first year or two, the yields might not be as good as they would be in subsequent years. But if you can get farmyard manure, if you have to beg it, beg for it, borrow it or steal it, get it and put it on, particularly on your cereal area where you're going to sow oats or whatever it is, it will work magic on it, magic. And I mean, I know you, you have your own beef, but um, would they say kind of equine manure is as equally as good and, you know? Uh, for, do you see what you're in, in, in the manure? Uh, okay, you have nutrients in it, but it is more, what's most important is the biology of it. Mm -hmm. So while horse manure doesn't have very high levels of P and K in it, it has a good lot of biology in it, you know? So to get different sources of biology is really important. So if you could get it from, from, from cattle, from sheep, from horses, I have got it from the zoo, from, from, from elephants. <laughs> and and yeah. that's not for P and K. But the biology, the range of biology in elephant's poo, apparently, is greater than any other carnivore. Mm, well, oh, sorry, her herbivore, excuse yeah, me. Yeah. The gut is massive, so I'm not surprised. And they eat vast quantities of it, yeah. Yeah. Um, so Sean Garvey, has meant, you mentioned damage by 250 HP tractors. What horsepower tractors, sorry. Um, what equipment do you use to avoid compaction? Uh, well, I first of all, my I have two tractors. Well, apart from my from a JCB, I have a 1978 165, and I have a 1997 Fiat 90, uh, 90 or something like that. So they're very light little tractors. There, you'd hardly get to buy a tractor as small as those. My contractor then doesn't have as uh, as uh, uh, what do we say, as gentle a tractor as I would like. It is 150 horsepower, it's not, it's not 250, but occasionally there might be a contractor would come in here to spread um, uh, dairy sludge. I used to get it, I don't anymore. And they would come in with a massive tractor, a massive spreader, wheels two foot wide, and they put 20 tons in it, and then mortar everywhere to go, mm. roadways and everything, because they want to get on to the next person. It's all mad rush. So I've stopped, I've stopped doing that. But I, I have, I can't control that completely. You know, if you're going in there with a one pass system, you have to have uh, machinery that are able to manage that. But we try to make sure that we don't go on the land when the weather is not suitable. I think mm -hmm. that's, that's the starting point. Yeah, because you mentioned uh, docks earlier. They're, are they not considered indicative of compaction or is that, they're obviously indicative of other things as well, is it? <sighs> There's a lot unknown about docks, <laughs> you know, and, um, uh, you know, there are pe people swear that, that high levels of, of pee that go out in slurry and so on uh, ha will promote the growth of docks. There is no scientific evidence that that's the case from anything that I have been, that scientists are telling me there's no evidence for that. Mm. Uh, so okay. I don't know. There, docks are a bit of a mystery. <laughs> and a pain and in the you know what. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure they'd like to stay that way. Uh, yeah. Darren McKiernan says, How do you graze your cattle? Do you set stock paddock? Do you set stock paddock graze, mob graze, etc.? Um, I paddock graze, but not in the same intensity as I might be, as farmers would be expected to do nowadays. So, in other words, I'm not having them in a paddock and they're moved every day. To me, that's making, for me, I'm not saying for anybody else, for me, that's making an awful lot of work. And I don't know that the prize is very good at the end of it. So I, I love working hard, but, you know, don't ask me to do stuff that's not giving me some kind of a return in some form or other. So I suppose to answer the question in practical terms, I have the fields divided into bigger paddocks. If I had a 10 acre field, I'd probably just have divided in two and move the cattle whenever they need to be moved. And that might be after five days, it might be after seven days or whatever. So I played by ear all along, but I don't get hung up in having a, a, 
you know, a line of paddocks and you move the cattle every day, like the mob grazing, it suits some people, but uh, doing that stuff, moving cattle every day, so that, you know, that's too much work for me. Mm -hmm. No, it's fair enough, and I think that's really important for every farmer to to look at their own situation and, you know, and what, uh, you, know, you, you can't do everything. Like, and, well, as well as that, you have to stand back and see, is there, advantage, is there an advantage in what I'm doing? Or could I spend my time better at something else? Mm. And spending your time better at something else, if you're younger than I, than I am, might be having a part-time job. And then are you going to make more money out of that than the little extra you might make out of moving these cattle all the time? Mm. You know, so you, you have to examine your own situation like that and decide, you know, what's the greatest benefit with giving yourself some comfort, mm. you know. Perfect. Uh, Catherine's asked, what breed of cattle have you in organics? Uh, I suppose the smart answer to that is not the breed that I want. Uh, <laughs> it's very hard to avoid not having mainly continental cattle, such as limousine, Charlie, uh, Simiton, and so on. I would much prefer to have Hereford crosses, Angus crosses, uh, for the simple reason that Hereford and Angus crosses will finish, if you have good silage on it, it really is critical to have really good silage. Uh, if you have that, uh, you should not need to feed them any supplementary feed in the form of nuts uh, to fatten them. Whereas if you have continental cattle, they're just not designed for the Irish feed stuff that's available normally in Ireland. They're not designed for our climate. They're designed for being housed indoors on the continent where the feed is brought into them and the feed is generally maize silage, which is way, way higher quality than grass. And they're brought to big heavy weights and the market is very happy with that. The factories here don't want real big heavy cattle. And I don't want them because they'll poach the land if, if the weather gets wet. They, they'll eat so much more than the smaller cattle and they're just too damn hard to fatten. Mm -hmm. But I can only buy what's offered to me in the marketplace. Mm. So it's quite limited in the organic market. Um, Pat, thank you so much for this evening. It's been really uh, inspirational listening to you talking about, you know, such a range of your businesses, how you got into it, how you have got, you know, you, you sell the finished product and stuff and, you know, the kind of the, the line in between, like connecting your land to, to your customer and stuff. So thanks very much. Um, I see behind you, you have a sign saying this farm supports hoofs for hospice. And I know that you've kind of donated your payment tonight towards that. Uh, do you want to just explain to people what Hoofs for Hospice is? Uh, yeah, yeah. Thanks for the opportunity, Bridget. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, cheering up a local, a local group here in Offaly. Uh, I live in Westmead, but this is, this is in Offaly. In <laughs> um, uh, to raise funds to build a hospice for the Midland counties of Longford, Westmead, Offaly and Leash. It's the only region in the country now that has no inpatient, uh, full-time, de uh, dedicated hospice. Um, so if anybody in those four counties has to avail of hospice care, they've got to go to Dublin, Galway or Limerick. And like for a family, you know, when someone is in hospice, you need to visit them regularly, daily, you know, because they're a wonderful place to be, but you still need family support. And what a hospice is designed to do is to create a home from home for people who are so sick that they can't be taken care of at home. It is generally agreed that most people want to die at home, you know, but sometimes your medical condition is so unmanageable that you do have to go in for the specialized care. So we don't have that in the Midlands. So a group of us have got together to raise a million euro for this and we're asking farmers to rear an animal for us. And farmers have been fantastic. We have just over 600 animals in our herd now. And this is all done since COVID began. We have farmers rearing two and three animals for us. And when they're sold, they give us the money and they'll rear another two or three. Other farmers will rear an animal if we find the animal for them, or they will give us an animal to put onto another farm. But the generosity is mind blowing. It is just incredible. We had one farmer sold an animal for us today. I don't know the value of it yet because it went to the factory. It weighed 480 kilograms in the mm. factory. So it'll come to close to two and a half grand. 
Yeah. And can you imagine going into any other business and asking them for two and a half grand? Mm. You know, yeah. it'll run you. And yeah, no, so, it's, it's like, farmers are phenomenally generous. No, yeah. that's that sounds really, uh, really in, inspirational and really nice. And no better man to kind of drive it to the end. Obviously, you know, you you obviously uh, give everything within. Uh, what you do a good lash anyway um if well, people want sorry. to contact it directly or support it directly is there a website yeah if the google uh, hooves for hospice that's h-o-o-v-e-s the number four right there's in four hooves yeah. hospice hooves for four hospice the sign is right behind you so we can uh, we, yeah. we, we can see that and, and, and just just to say Bridget we have cattle from the four provinces we have cattle from 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 Cork from Mayo, from Louth, from Cavan, you know, from all over the place. And, and they have no, they're not going to benefit from this hospice, but they just see how important it is, so. Yeah, it's a great, great. idea. It's, well, well, maybe yeah. it's something that can spread out elsewhere. Um, and if people want to contact you or your business directly, it's Kilbegan Oats. Um, so I'm sure they can find you through that or, and through your social, you're on social media and stuff. Well, someone's on social media for you if it's not Someone, you. My son, John, who, <laughs> who came home from Australia in 2015, he's now running the party business and I'm back full-time farming, if you like, you know. Brilliant. So if he does the social media. I wouldn't be able to, I don't even know how to spell social media. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, for anyone that, um, that uh, wishes to share this uh, Q&A with anyone, like I say, it'll be up on our YouTube channel. And um, our next session will be on the 5th of April with court farmer Madeleine McKeever, who is, again, an organic farmer, but she um, she's beef and seeds. She produces open pollinated seeds. So it's called Brown Envelope Seeds, her business. But until then, thanks again, Pat. Thanks so much for your time. Really inspirational. Lovely to chat to you. And we'll be in contact. And thank you to everyone for joining us. You're very welcome, Bridget. Thank you. Bye Take now. Care. We'll chat to you soon. Thank you.